Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by Jacqueline Brown, author of The Light Series, a best-selling Catholic fiction series that will leave you asking, who would I become if the world fell away? Enter code MYSTERIOUSWORLD at Jacqueline-Brown.com for 10% off. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. Previously on Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. We're talking about David Koresh, the Branch Davidians, and the Waco siege that resulted in a Texas apocalypse. They realized that they were under surveillance, and Koresh thought that they were likely to be attacked. Then, on August 22nd, 1992 things got even worse. They learned that in Idaho, the ATF staged a raid on the house of a man named Randy Weaver at a place called Ruby Ridge. The Ruby Ridge incident was a huge black eye for federal law enforcement. And you can imagine what the Davidians thought. The federal government had attacked a family in their home, which contained four children. Koresh is reported to have wondered, is it a dress rehearsal for an attack on Mount Carmel? We'll talk about Ruby Ridge in a future episode. Listening to episode 114 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the 1992 government siege at Ruby Ridge. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. On August 21st, 1992, 28 years ago today, as we release this episode, Federal law enforcement agents approached a cabin in the remote Idaho mountains and engaged in a deadly firefight. Inside the cabin, located on Ruby Ridge, were Randy and Vicki Weaver, along with their four children and a family friend. Federal law enforcement had tried to entrap Randy into becoming an informant for them, but when he refused to become one, events spiraled out of control. There followed an 11 day siege of the cabin involving up to 400 agents. And when it was all over, Randy's son and wife would be dead, and the FBI would have a huge black eye. So what led to this situation? Who was at fault? And how did things go so disastrously bad? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So, Jimmy, what do we need to say before we begin our discussion? Like our discussion of the Branch Davidians, this is a story that has some disturbing elements. As always, we will be keeping things clinical and not dwelling on gory details. There will also be a few cases of brief minor bad language from the historical accounts of the events, but the episode may not be suitable for for all listeners, and parents should be advised in making decisions for their families. Very good. Uh, Jimmy, uh, we often talk about personal connections to mysteries. Do you have a personal connection to this one? I don't know how aware of this mystery I was at the time it was unfolding. I likely heard reports about it on the news, but I don't have any memories of those reports. The reason is that I was very distracted by other things going on in my life, because in August of 1992, my wife, Renee, was dying. On August 22nd, the second day of the Ruby Ridge siege, I was received into the Catholic Church in her hospital room using the emergency shortened form of the rites. And on August 26th, the sixth day of the siege, Renee passed away. So needless to say, my attention was elsewhere while all of this was happening. However, I did learn about the events later on, and together with the Waco siege that occurred a few months later, it stands out as one of the worst abuses of federal law enforcement authorities in the 1990s. Okay, so where should we begin this story? The place to start is with the family of Randy and Vicki Weaver. Randy Weaver was born in 1948 in Iowa. 
He was raised in a religious family, though the family hopped around from church to church, all within the Protestant community. In 1968, when he was 20 years old and the Vietnam War was raging, he joined the military and became a Green Beret, which for our listeners overseas means he was a member of a special operations force in the U.S. Army. While he was in the military, one of his commanding officers was Lieutenant Colonel Bo Greitz, who is a rather colorful figure who has run several times as a third-party presidential candidate in the U.S., though he's never had a chance of winning. He'll come back into our story later. And for fans of The A-Team, the uh, TV show The A-Team, George Papard's character, Hannibal Smith, the leader of The A-Team, was apparently loosely based on Bo Greitz. In 1971, Randy Weaver was honorably discharged from the Army, and a month later, he married his wife, Vicki. Vicki Weaver had been born in 1949, so she was a year younger than Randy, and her maiden name was Jordison. She was born into a family that was a member of the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Is that the same Mormon church that's based in Salt Lake City, Utah? No, it's a different group. After the death of the Mormon prophet, Joseph Smith, who we discussed back in episode 50, a succession crisis occurred. Eventually, most of Smith's followers ended up being led by Brigham Young, who relocated the church's headquarters to Salt Lake City, Utah. However, the second largest faction followed Joseph Smith's eldest son, Joseph Smith III, and in 1860, they founded the Reorganized Church, which is based in Independence, Missouri. Over time, the theology of the Reorganized Church has changed. They have accepted the doctrine of the Trinity. And today they are basically Protestant in their outlook, though they do have some unusual beliefs, including still honoring Joseph Smith as a prophet and accepting the Book of Mormon. To distance themselves from the Utah Mormons and further their identification with Trinitarian Christians, they've also changed their name. And since 2001, they've been known as the Community of Christ. But back when Vicki Weaver was growing up, they were still called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When Randy and Vicki got married, they had the service performed by two ministers, one a Protestant Congregationalist and one a Reorganized Mormon in deference to Vicki's family. And when did the Weavers start having children? In 1976, the Weavers had their first daughter, Sarah. In 1978, they had a son named Sammy, and in 1982, they had another daughter named Rachel. Around the time of Sammy's birth, Vicki read a book that was very popular in the 1970s. In fact, other than the Bible, it was the best-selling nonfiction book of the decade. By this point, Randy and Vicki were attending a Baptist church, and the book was popular in Baptist circles. It was by evangelist Hal Lindsey, and it was called The Late Great Planet Earth. The book advocated views that are known in prophetic circles as dispensational premillennialism. According to this view, Jesus will return soon and rapture away his followers. Then the Antichrist will appear, war will break out, the Battle of Armageddon will take place, the Second Coming will happen, after which there will be a thousand years of peace with Jesus physically reigning on Earth. The author of The Late Great Planet Earth, Hal Lindsey, argued that all these events would occur in just the next few years, basically starting to come to fulfillment in the 1980s. The book made a profound impression on Vicki, who was the religious leader of the family. By 1981, the Weavers had begun holding rather unusual Bible study groups in their home, involving people who called themselves legalists because they took Old Testament law as being literally applicable to Christians. In his book, Ruby Ridge, Jess Walters states, So when Vicki decided her family would follow Old Testament law and stop eating unclean meat like pork and oysters, no one in the group thought she'd come about the decision from anywhere but Scripture and His divine will. There would be anywhere from four to ten people at the Weaver's house, sometimes as often as four nights a week. Randy led the Bible study most of the time, but everyone read chapters and commented on what they might mean. Vicky was clearly the scripturalist and scholar of the group. It was as if she had memorized the whole thing, from Genesis to Revelation, Acts to Zechariah. They read only the King James Version of the Bible because, Vicky said, other translations weren't divinely inspired and were pagan-influenced. 
By 1981, the Old Testament books were opening up for Randy and Vicky, not as outdated stories, but as the never-ending law of the Maker. He was opening their eyes to what was happening now in the United States, just as Hal Lindsey had foretold. The forces of evil, the Soviet Union, the U.S. government, Jewish bankers, were ready to strike at any time against American people. And so Randy and Vicky became convinced that they needed to get out of Dodge, or at least get out of Cedar Falls, Iowa, which is where they were living. They had begun having dreams, meaning literal nighttime dreams, about the coming time of trouble and about living on a remote mountain to endure it. And so, in 1983, they moved to Ruby Ridge. Where is Ruby Ridge? It's in Boundary County, Idaho, which is so named because it's the northernmost county of the state, right up against the border or boundary with Canada. In fact, Ruby Ridge is a mountain ridge that's only 30 miles from the Canadian border. It's a remote place, and in the 1980s, many people were going there to get away from the world. Jess Walter explains, There were no zoning codes in Boundary County, no sewer, no fast food chains, No building codes, not even a stoplight. No one flinched when a man walked into a store wearing a pistol on his hip. The state itself held more than just a million people, only 3,000 of them black, in an area as big as New England. Such places have always attracted recluses, but until the early 1980s, those people were coming from the other end of the political spectrum. Hippies, draft dodgers, an entire back-to-the-land movement. But Boundary County doesn't discriminate. Anyone can hide there. In fact, the county, like much of North Idaho, like much of the West, always attracted people whose only common trait was the overwhelming desire to just get away. Sometimes it was more than a desire. The convicted spy Christopher Boyce found support and a place to hide in Boundary County. And there were always others trying on new names and identities. Boundary County defies stereotyping. It is the home of survivalists, but also of pacifist Mennonites. Democrats usually win the elections, but most residents would probably tell you they're conservative. Left and right swing out as far as they'll go and then connect in boundary, where people take the opposite political tracks to the same conclusion, that they want to be left alone. In the early 1980s, it was Randy and Vicky and people like them who were looking for Boundary County and places like it, looking for a ridge top on which to hide out and build a life. A blurring continuum of homeschoolers, Christian survivalists, apocalyptics, John Birchers, Posse Comitatus members, constitutionalists, tax protesters, identity Christians, and neo-Nazis found one another at the Army-Navy surplus store in Sandpoint, or the Barter Fair in Northport, or the bookstore at the Aryan Nations Church at nearby Hayden Lake, Idaho. From California, Florida, Indiana, and Iowa, they talked of reading the same thing, coming to the same understandings, and they picked up beliefs and ideas from each other. And there, the Weavers purchased 20 acres, and Randy built them a cabin in the, out in the woods on Ruby Ridge. Did the Weavers pick up ideas from the various eccentrics in the area? They were certainly confirmed in some of their own eccentricities, and they seemed to take a sharper line on one issue than they had before, the issue of race. Randy and Vicky had become influenced by what's known as the Christian Identity Movement, which holds that white Europeans, or at least many of them, are descended from the Lost Tribes of Israel. And we talked about the Lost Tribes of Israel back in episode 14. The Christian Identity View, though, is not well supported by the evidence. The Old Testament says where the Lost Tribes went, and it wasn't Europe. It was to Iraq and Iran. But Christian identity people believe that white American Christians are inheritors of God's promises in a special way. And so needless to say, there's a lot of white supremacy and thus racism in the Christian identity movement. According to Randy Weaver, though, he didn't believe in white supremacy. He also made it clear that he was opposed to slavery. But he did believe in racial separation, that the races ought to be separate. That's a view found in other groups also. Thus, there are black separatists and even black nationalists who believe that there should be separate nations for black and white Americans. Examples of that view include people in the Nation of Islam and the new Black Panther Party. I'll say up front that I think this viewpoint is really problematic as well as totally impractical. The solution for racial tension here in America is not to separate but to learn to live together in harmony and love, because 
we are all God's children, and he doesn't care about your skin color any more than he cares about your hair color or eye color. So I don't buy the Weavers' racial separatist ideas at all. How did the Weavers' ideas get them into trouble? In 1986, even though he wasn't a neo-Nazi himself, Randy visited an event held by the Aryan Nations. British journalist John Ronson picks up the story in his book, Them, Adventures with Extremists. As much as Randy shared his wife's beliefs about how the separatist weavers needed to isolate themselves from the tyranny of the impending world government, and so on, Randy liked to cut loose once in a while and go drinking in populated areas. Unfortunately, one of the populated areas he chose was the nearby Aryan Nations, a militant neo-Nazi community and gathering place for skinheads and racists. They wore their hearts on their sleeves in the form of swastika armbands. Aryan Nations holds a big summer camp every year, and Randy visited four years running, sometimes taking the children along. He says now that he would invariably get into fights with the neo-Nazis about their beliefs. He says their disagreement centered on who exactly constituted the secret clique of global elitists who were implementing a planetary takeover. The neo-Nazis blamed the Jews exclusively, whereas Randy felt that focusing antipathy onto a single race was a mistake. He didn't consider himself to be a white uh, supremacist. He was a separatist. This may sound pedantic, but it wasn't pedantic to him. But still, he liked the neo-Nazis as people, and he thought their countryside and picnic areas were nice. Randy was finally kicked out of the place for smuggling in a six-pack of beer. Aryan Nations is terribly intolerant about beer drinking, too. And may I say, I find it totally ironic, given the prominence of beer in German culture, that Aryan Nations would be intolerant of beer drinking at one of their events. It's something I never would have expected. I, I'm going to guess, unless it says otherwise in John Ronson's book, that maybe they just didn't want him bringing in beer. They wanted to sell the beer. <laughs> oh, well, Ronson doesn't go into that, but <laughs> maybe. Who knows? Yes. Yeah. But now we need to talk about another man who is named Gus Magisono, except, as Jess Walter explains, There was no Gus Magisono. It was a cover dreamed up by Kenneth Fadley, a 39-year-old private investigator from Spokane. He'd worked in marketing for STP, the gasoline additive, before getting into the business of confidential informing in 1983, when a friend who happened to be a Spokane cop was killed during an investigation of motorcycle gangs. I took it pretty personal, Fadley said. Unlike most informants, Fadley didn't have a criminal record and only did it because of his friend, because of the excitement, and because of the little money he made. He also found that his personality was suited to undercover work, to adopting a new identity and rooting out criminals. But he was at his best infiltrating the Aryan nations. In 1984, while investigating a church that was stockpiling automatic rifles, Fadley met a Georgia-friendly agent with a Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms named Herb Byerly. Two years later, with federal law enforcement worried again about white supremacists in Idaho, Byerly had talked the informant into attending the 1986 World Congress. The 1986 Congress was to be the radical right signal that it wasn't going away. At the Aryans' Hayden Lake compound, Fadley talked with survivalists, white separatists, constitutionalists, the entire spectrum of far-right activists, even Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. He jotted down license plates and met men who would later be arrested for a spree of bombings in the Northwest. And one of the people he befriended there was Randy Weaver. But he had secret plans for Randy. Under instructions from his superior, ATF agent Herb Byerly, he made Randy a surprising offer. According to John Ronson, Gus asked Randy to rob banks with him and hoard machine guns. Gus told Randy that the New World Order, the secret clique of international bankers, could be overthrown only with ordered violence. Randy told Gus that he wasn't interested. One day, Gus asked Randy to sell him two sawed-off shotguns. Randy said okay. He asked Gus where he wanted them sawed. Gus pointed to a spot on the barrel that was a quarter of an inch outside the legal limit. Randy sawed away. Gus wasn't his real name, of course. He was an undercover informant for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The plan was to entice Randy into sawing off the shotguns below the legal limit and then offer him a deal. He could either become a government informant and spy on Aryan nations, or he could go to jail for illegal gun running. <laughs> 
Now we need to explain a point of law. In American law, there is a concept known as entrapment, whereby someone working for the state encourages a person to commit an illegal act that they otherwise would have been unlikely or unwilling to commit. Most American people don't want police trying to trick them into committing crimes so that they can be prosecuted, and so entrapment is greatly frowned upon. In many jurisdictions, law enforcement must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they did not entrap a person in order to get a conviction. Although Ken Fadley, a.k.a. Gus Magisono, was not himself a law enforcement officer, he was acting as the agent of a member of the ATF, and so if he entrapped Randy Weaver into sawing off the shotguns, Randy would have a defense in court. And here there's a dispute. According to Fadley, Weaver volunteered to make the sawed-off shotguns, but according to Weaver, it was Fadley who asked him to do business. Walter continues, Randy got into his truck and pulled a gun case from behind the seat. He opened it, pulled out the kind of shotgun they'd been talking about, and pointed to a spot on the barrel. According to Fadley, Randy said, I can cut it off to about here. The government informant pointed to the gun and said, about here, or about here? Fadley insisted later at trial that it was a question. Weaver said it was an instruction. Either way, they were set. They made a plan to meet on Thursday and exchange the guns and the money. Randy seemed relieved. I need to make some money, Gus. Hey, if this works out, maybe I can keep feeding my kids. It's a struggle, ain't it? As we noted, Fadley and the ATF weren't interested in entrapping Randy just so they could get a conviction and send him to prison. They were interested in him for an entirely different reason. They wanted him to introduce them to a man Randy knew in Montana, but he became suspicious of Fadley and turned him down. Then, Fadley's cover got blown at Aryan Nations, and he had to retire the, just, the Gus Magisono identity and bow out of the whole matter. With Fadley out of the picture, Fadley's boss, ATF agent Herb Byerly, wanted a new informant with connections inside Aryan Nations. So, in October of 1989, he decided to put the squeeze on Randy, threatening to charge him with selling the sawed off shotguns unless. He started working for them. John Ronson explains, For the government, Randy had the makings of a perfect informant, a slightly crazy person who was friends with far crazier people, a family man with bad finances. How could he turn them down? But he didn't just turn them down. He made a great big burlesque show of turning them down. Hey, Vicky, he yelled. Come out here. Take a look at these guys. Guess what they just asked me to do? Write down their names, and so on. And since he wouldn't become an informant, the authorities began to go through with the threat to prosecute Randy on the shotgun charge. In June of 1990, they filed charges, and as part of that, they said that Weaver was a bank robber with criminal convictions. This was absolutely false. And in 1995, a Senate investigation by the U.S. Senate concluded that, quote, Weaver was not a suspect in any bank robberies, close quote. But in December of 1990, a federal grand jury indicted Randy for making and possessing illegal weapons, but not for selling them. Weaver would now be prosecuted, and so the authorities set out to arrest him. But they thought Weaver was too dangerous to arrest on his own property, so they did something else. On January 17th, Randy and Vicky were heading into town, and on the snowy roads, they found a pickup truck that had apparently broken down with a blonde, shaggy-haired guy working on it and his wife shivering in the cold with no coat on. As people who live in the country naturally do, they stop to help. Walter reports, They stopped the truck before the bridge. Randy opened his door and hopped out. The young woman walked toward Vicky's side of the truck, and so Vicky opened the door and stepped out into the snow to greet her. What's the matter with your truck? Oh, it's broke down, the woman said. We were trying to get it off the road, and you were the first people who came along. Randy kept walking toward the open hooded pickup. From behind, he could see the guy, early 30s, scraggly jeans, flannel, surfer hair, still messing around under the hood. You broken down? Randy asked. Fifteen feet from the truck, Randy slowed, and the long-haired guy spun around in the snow and jammed a 9mm pistol toward Randy's face. 
Federal agent, you're under arrest. The county sheriff, Bruce Whitaker, jumped out of the back of the camper with three ATF agents, including Herb Byerly. From the woods, Agent Steve Gunderson in full snow camouflage kept the scope of his AR-15 trained on Randy Weaver's chest. Get on the ground, yelled Lance Hart. Vicky was the responsibility of Agent Barbara Anderson. Turn around, yelled the petite woman with no coat. Get down. Vicky turned to run away, but Anderson ran a few steps, pushed her, and Vicky fell face first into the snowbank. There was yelling and confusion as Hart wrestled Randy to the snow-crested ground, put the gun against his stomach, and waited for the other agents to help subdue Randy. A short newspaper story about the arrest said Randy offered no resistance, and he wasn't charged with resisting arrest. Vicky cried as they took her husband away, and this incident did nothing to encourage her to trust the government, which she viewed as under Satan's control. Randy spent the night in jail, and the next day he was released on bail with an unsecured bond of $10,000. The only thing he had that was worth $10,000 was his property on Ruby Ridge. This meant that if he failed to show up in court, the Weavers would lose their land, and Randy promised to show up at his trial. And now there comes another legal complication to the story. According to a 1994 Department of Justice report, when Weaver was arraigned on the weapons charges in January 1991, he was told that his trial would commence on February 19, 1991. Two weeks later, the court clerk notified the parties that the trial date had been changed to February 20, 1991. Shortly thereafter, the U.S. Probation Office sent Weaver a letter which incorrectly referenced his trial date as March 20, 1991. After Weaver failed to appear for trial on February 20, the court issued a bench warrant for his arrest. Three weeks later, on March 14th, a federal grand jury indicted Weaver for his failure to appear for trial. We found that the government, especially the U.S. Attorney's Office or USAO, was unnecessarily rigid in its approach to the issues created by the erroneous letter. That the USAO improvidently sought an indictment before March 20th, 1991, and that the USAO erred in failing to inform the grand jury of the erroneous letter. So, the U.S. Probation Office erroneously told Randy that his trial had been rescheduled for March 20th instead of February 20th, and he naturally didn't show up on that date. Then, instead of waiting for him to show up on March 20th, they had a grand jury indict him for failure to appear. They also failed to tell the grand jury that the reason he didn't show up is because the authorities sent him a letter telling him not to show up, which was something that they knew. At this point, the case was assigned to the U.S. Marshals, who were charged with bringing in fugitives. The Marshals did a threat assessment based on what they were told, and it was shot through with falsehoods. In his book, Christian Identity, the Aryan American Bloodline Religion, Dr. Chester Quarles explains. Deputy U.S. Marshal Ron Mays had made a threat assessment in preparation for the arrest. In his statements before the civil court that ultimately awarded Randy Weaver a multi-million dollar settlement, Marshal Mays indicated that he had been erroneously told that Randy Weaver had been growing marijuana. Randy Weaver had been involved in a bank robbery. Randy Weaver had heavy caliber guns mounted on tripods around the compound, his shack. Randy Weaver was a member of Aryan Nations. Randy Weaver had threatened the life of the President of the United States, i.e. Ronald Reagan. Randy Weaver wanted to shoot officers because of his Green Beret training. Randy Weaver was a loose cannon who planted explosive traps on his properties. All of these claims were false. And so, as in the case of the Branch Davidians, the authorities' claims were shot through with demonstrable errors, which in some cases may have amounted to outright lies. As with the Davidians, the authorities falsely believed that they were dealing with violent revolutionary people who were stockpiling illegal weapons when they weren't. The Weavers, meanwhile, had come to thoroughly distrust the government officials that they were dealing with. John Ronson reports, In a preliminary hearing, the magistrate told Randy that he'd lose the cabin if he lost the case. Randy and Vicky considered themselves to be in a no-win situation. They would lose the cabin if they failed to appear, but they were bound to lose the case, so they would lose the cabin even if they did appear. They decided not to show up in court anymore. They buried their heads in the sand. Through the rest of 1991 and the first half of 1992, they stayed holed up in their cabin. Ronson notes, 
A young family friend, Kevin Harris, moved in with them. The family took to carrying guns at all times. They became increasingly convinced that the New World Order was watching them from the bushes. They discovered that they were, in fact, being watched from the bushes. They found a surveillance camera and tore it down. Randy let it be known that he would not be taken off the mountain alive, although most of the people who knew him considered these words to be just bravado. The U.S. Marshal Service named their surveillance program of the Weavers Operation Northern Exposure after a popular TV program of the time. And yet there were aspects of the program that were grossly incompetent. In 1995, the U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee noted that the psychological profile they worked up on Randy not only dramatically overestimated the threat he posed, it also contained no firsthand interviews and was prepared by someone so unfamiliar with him that it referred to him repeatedly as Mr. Randall instead of Mr. Weaver. They couldn't even get his name right. Also, during the standoff, on a happier note, Vicky gave birth to a new baby girl who they named Elisheba. She was born in a special birthing shed before the midwife could even arrive on the Weaver's property, where they had no electricity, no running water. So it was a natural childbirth in the greatest sense. And thank God, baby Elisheba was healthy and fine. But eventually, the standoff would come to a dramatic end. When did that occur? By August 1992, authorities had determined to arrest Randy Weaver at the cabin, and they were making preparations to do so. According to a 1993 article in Reason magazine, On August 21, 1992, the ultimate tragedy began. A six-man team from the Special Operations Group of the U.S. Marshal Service came onto the Weaver's property at 4.30 a.m., dressed in full camouflage and ski masks, carrying night vision goggles, and silenced 9mm M16 machine guns with laser scopes. Three deputy marshals, Lawrence Cooper, William Deegan, and Art Roderick, poked around close to the cabin, while the other three, in radio contact, were placed at observation points. The agents testified that they were doing surveillance for a possible future operation. A medical team was on alert at the bottom of the hill. So this was 4.30 in the morning when the Weavers and their house guest, Kevin Harris, who was in his early 20s, would be expected to be asleep, but they weren't, and neither were their dogs. After poking around the property for a while, the three deputy marshals stood behind the rock near the driveway, well below the cabin, and started throwing little stones up toward the cabin to, quote, see if they could get the dog's attention, end quote. Soon, Stryker, the family's yellow Labrador, began following the agents who circled the property along the logging road to a Y in the road, where there's a thick stand of trees. Sammy Weaver and Kevin Harris, apparently believing the dog had sniffed out a deer or some other game, the family was out of meat, followed the dog along the logging road. Randy Weaver went down the straighter, easier trail. It's a fairly standard hunting practice to get a deer surrounded and trapped. Cooper testified that before the deputy marshals could take cover, he said they feared being shot in the back, they saw Randy coming down the trail and ordered him to stop. Randy yelled at Kevin and Sammy to head back for the cabin, that it was an ambush. He fired a couple of shots in the air and ran toward the cabin. Cooper and Deegan took cover in the stand of trees. The dog and the two boys came to the Y and turned up the trail toward the cabin. What happened next is still in dispute. According to some accounts, the U.S. Marshals identified themselves and yelled stop, after which Kevin Harris opened fire and shot Marshal Deegan dead. According to the Weaver's account, the Marshals did not identify themselves, so they did not know who was shooting at their party. The Marshals shot Stryker, the dog, twice, killing him. 14-year-old Sammy Weaver then yelled, You shot my dog, you son of a bitch, e excuse the language, and fired a couple of rounds in the darkness without hitting anyone. The Marshals then opened fire again, hitting and severely wounding Sammy in the arm. Randy yelled for Sammy and Kevin to return to the cabin. Sammy yelled, I'm coming, Dad, and began running back to the cabin. But the Marshals opened fire again, hitting Sammy in the back and killing him. With Sammy down, Kevin Harris then fired his rifle in self-defense toward the source of the shots that had killed Sammy, striking and killing Marshal Deegan. What is agreed upon in both accounts is that 
in the conflict, the dog was killed, as were Sammy Weaver and Marshall William Deegan. In the reason section, we will look at who is telling the truth. Later that morning, Marshal Dave Hunt requested support, and an 11-day siege of the Weaver's cabin began. John Ronson notes, The U.S. Marshals called for backup, and an army of 400 troops was dispatched within the next 24 hours to surround the cabin and the nearby roads and the meadow below. There were U.S. Marshals and FBI snipers and gas masks and face paint and camouflage, local police, state police, the BATF, the Internal Revenue Service, the U.S. Border Patrol, Highway Patrol from four states, city police, and the Forestry Service. They had tanks and armored personnel carriers. The FBI's elite hostage rescue team took control. They sealed off an area of 20 square miles at a cost of a million dollars a day. More federal troops were flown in by helicopter. They built a new road up the mountain for the tanks. Martial law was declared by the state governor who called the Weaver Cabin an extreme emergency and disaster area. Taking us inside the FBI efforts, former agent Gary Nosner explains in his book, Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator. Almost immediately upon arrival at Ruby Ridge on August 22nd, hostage rescue team leader Dick Rogers sent FBI HRT snipers and observers up the mountain to reconnoiter the Weaver Cabin. He did so with rules of engagement that were substantially less restrictive than those customarily employed. The normal rules state that FBI agents may use their weapons only to protect their own lives or the lives of others or if they feel they are in danger of serious bodily harm. But according to a Justice Department task force that subsequently investigated the incident, Dick Rogers' rules, quote, instructed the snipers that before a surrender announcement was made, they could and should shoot all armed adult males appearing outside the cabin, end quote. These rules not only contradicted long-standing FBI policy, they were later found to be unconstitutional. So, got that? Before a surrender announcement, FBI snipers could and should shoot all armed adult males appearing outside the cabin. Wow, no wonder that was ruled unconstitutional. A 1996 Senate report characterized these as a virtual shoot-on-site orders. And those rules of engagement immediately led to disaster. After the U.S. Marshals killed his son, Randy Weaver had wrapped Sammy's body in blankets and put it in the birthing shed where baby Elisheba had been born. On Saturday, August 22nd, the same morning I was received into the Catholic Church, Randy, his 16-year-old daughter Sarah, and Kevin Harris were outside checking out a noise that the dogs had alerted them to. Not knowing about the shoot-any-armed-adult-male-on-site orders, Randy and Kevin had rifles with them, although Sarah didn't. Walter states, On the way back to the cabin, Randy stopped and stared full at the birthing shed. I just gotta see Sammy one more time, he said. He walked over rocks and brush along the edge of the knob that faced the north ridge. Randy Weaver stood at the door of the birthing shed for just a breath, and then he reached for the handle with his right hand. On a hill 200 yards behind Randy was FBI hostage rescue team sniper Lon Horiuchi. He was so far away that there was no way he would have been heard even if he had, had announced himself, so he didn't, and prepared to fire without any warning or announcement to surrender. Horiuchi later testified that he aimed his sniper rifle's crosshairs at Randy's spine, intending to sever it and kill him instantly. But at the last second, Randy moved, and when the shot rang out, it only caught him in the right shoulder, exiting his armpit. When she heard the shot, Sarah spun around and ran toward her father, branches and weeds crackling beneath her feet. Damn, if she'd been shielding him the way she was supposed to, this never would have happened. She darted around the birthing shed and saw her father holding his armpit. What happened? I've been hit. Get to the house, she yelled. Get to the house. Randy was running in front and Sarah ran behind him as close as she could get, trying to shield him, expecting any second to be dropped from behind as Sammy had been. She winced in terror and ran as fast as her dad could move ahead of her, but the cabin, a few yards off, seemed miles away. Kevin Harris was bringing up the rear, running and ducking, his rifle dangling in his hand. 
Vicky had heard the shot as well, and she ran out of the house holding ten-month-old baby Elisheba under her right arm. A few feet from the door, she saw Randy running toward her. What happened? I've been shot, Randy yelped as he rounded toward the house. As she moved toward the door, Vicky yelled at the hill where the shot had come from. Bastards! Murderers! She threw open the heavy door, which had a curtained window at eye level, and swung out in the direction of the hill where the shot had come from. Vicky stood behind the door on the porch. Randy and Sarah were bursting through the doorway onto the wood floor, and Kevin was gathering himself to dive into the cabin, at the same time trying to push Randy and Sarah out of the way. You bastards, Vicky yelled, and then there was another shot. Vicky Weaver lay dead on the porch, her hand still holding baby Elisheba. Kevin was wounded as well. The only people in the cabin who were not wounded were the two older daughters, Sarah and Rachel, and baby Elisheba. The survivors pulled Vicky's body into the cabin and covered it with a blanket. Only several hours later did federal law enforcement officials announce themselves to the Weavers, who up to now, according to the Weavers, did not know who was shooting at them the previous night or this day. Needless to say, the ensuing days were inhumanly difficult for the survivors, and we will spare you the details of what happened. Now, according to the authorities, they didn't know that Vicky was dead, and perhaps that's true. However, John Ronson notes, The military set up base camp a few hundred yards down the mountain. The rumor went that some army person hammered a sign into the ground outside the tents calling their temporary barracks Camp Vicky. I remember hearing people underneath the house rustling through our stuff, said Rachel. I remember the floodlights coming in through the cracks in the curtains and hearing their stupid half-tracks rolling over our stuff in the yard. Rachel told me this as we sat at our kitchen table. The tanks crunched our generator, said Rachel, rolled over our outhouse. Not to mention, after they shot our dog and my brother, they ran over the dog. Rachel said, just sick. She said every day they would shout at us through some bullhorn. They'd yell, Vicky, Vicky, tell Randy to pick up the phone. Vicky, we're having blueberry pancakes for breakfast. What are you having for breakfast? And Dad would scream out, you sons of bitches, you shot her. You know she's dead. And they'd never answer us. I know they could hear us through the walls. These were just plywood walls. I remember being really mad at them for acting like nothing was wrong. So the FBI hostage rescue team was using psychological warfare intimidation tactics like they'd use again during the Waco siege. Now, the Waco siege lasted 51 days, but the Ruby Ridge siege only lasted 11. So what brought it to a close? Despite the hostage rescue team's disdain for the FBI negotiation team, it was ultimately negotiation that did it. Remember Randy's former commanding officer, Lieutenant Bo Greitz? In 1992, he was running as a presidential candidate for the Populist Party, which is a very minor party in American politics. His campaign slogan was God, Guns, and Greitz. Gary Nosner writes, With Weaver's son Sammy and Vicky now dead, and Randy Weaver and Kevin Harris wounded, what remained of the Weaver family stayed in the cabin for another 10 days. When FBI headquarters instructed that negotiation efforts commence, negotiator Fred Lansley went up the hill in an armored personnel carrier and used a bullhorn just outside of the cabin to try to communicate, but they now refused all of his efforts. Based on what had transpired, they could only assume that the government was intent on killing them. Not too surprisingly, they were reluctant to talk. Eventually, former Green Beret James Bo Greitz, a heavily decorated Vietnam vet, who had made a second career as a survivalist, conspiracy theorist, and liaison to various right-wing groups, appeared on the scene, offering to serve as an intermediary in an effort to secure a peaceful surrender. He convinced the team that he had enough in common with Weaver that he'd be able to talk him out. Fred coached Greitz on the approach he should take, which was to convince those inside that they would not be harmed if they came out peacefully. Over a period of several days with Fred's coaching, Greitz and Jack McLam, another right-wing figure, helped convince Weaver and his family to come out by acting as their escorts down the mountain. Harris surrendered first, followed the next day by Weaver and his three daughters. Despite all the violence in the first hours of this incident, once they established good communications, the situation was resolved without any further loss of life, a testament to the value of negotiations. <laughs> 
By the way, notice that the Weavers didn't come out all at once, or the people in the cabin didn't. They came out in stages. So Kevin came out first, and when they saw that he wasn't killed, that gave them the confidence that they also wouldn't be killed if they came out. And so this was a trust-building exercise that gave the people still in the cabin the confidence to come out. And this was the same strategy that the FBI negotiation team Success was successfully using at Waco, getting little groups of people out in their flow, trickle, gush strategy of how to get everybody out. And it was working until the hostage rescue team's interference shut down the flow of people that they were getting out. Fortunately, here, unlike the Waco siege, negotiation prevailed and Ruby Ridge ended without further bloodshed and without a massive conflagration. Okay, so before we get into theories and faith and reason perspectives, I do want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Lenny B., Sam F., Rachel F., Brianna M., and Matthew G. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida at AaronV.com. And by The Light Series by Jacqueline Brown, a best-selling Catholic fiction series that will leave you asking, who would I become if the world fell away? Enter code MYSTERIOUSWORLD at Jacqueline-Brown.com for 10% off. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at RosaryArmy.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about the Ruby Ridge siege? From the reason perspective, there's the question of whether the ATF illegally entrapped Randy Weaver with the initial sawed-off shotgun charge. There's the question of who started the firefight that led to the death of Sammy Weaver and who specifically killed Sammy. There's the question of what crimes Randy Weaver may have been guilty of. And there's the question of what offenses law enforcement agents were guilty of. Finally, there will be several questions to look at under the faith perspective. Okay, so what can we say about Ruby Ridge from the reason perspective? Did the ATF illegally entrap Randy Weaver? They definitely entrapped him. But the question is whether they did so in an illegal manner. The 1994 Department of Justice Ruby Ridge Task Force concluded, We found insufficient evidence to sustain the charge that Weaver was illegally entrapped into selling the weapons. So insufficient evidence, meaning we didn't prove they didn't illegally entrap him, but the Department of Justice didn't feel they had enough to prove that they had illegally entrapped him. And that was the DOJ's opinion. And as far as I've been able to discover, the matter hasn't been tested in a criminal or civil court case. So people might reasonably disagree about was this an illegal version of entrapment or not. So what about who shot first in the exchange that killed Sammy Weaver? One of the marshals who survived the encounter was Lawrence Cooper. According to Reason Magazine... Cooper told the jury that as the boys passed their concealed spot, Marshal William Deegan crouched on one knee and yelled, Stop, U.S. Marshal! Whereupon Kevin fired his .30-06 rifle from the hip and shot Deegan in the chest. So according to Cooper, it was Kevin Harris who fired first, and Deegan was killed by the first bullet. However, Idaho State Police Captain David Neal testified that shortly after the battle, Marshal Roderick told him that he, Roderick, had fired first, wounding and then killing Sammy's dog, Stryker. And although the government initially claimed that Deegan was killed by the first shot of the battle, seven shells from his gun were found near the deputy marshal's hiding place. What is certain is that the dog was shot in the rear end, suggesting that he was running away, and then killed by a second shot. Sammy Weaver, who was running toward the cabin, wheeled around yelled something like, you shot my dog, you son of a bitch, fired a couple of rounds, and started running again. He was shot twice, first wounded in the elbow and then killed by a bullet in the back. Kevin fired his thirty out 6 at the marshals and believed he had hit Deegan, though he insists the marshals started shooting first 
and he was firing in self-defense after Sammy was hit. On the one hand, we have two of the marshals, Cooper and Roderick, claiming that it was Kevin Harris who fired first. However, Harris maintains that it was the marshals who shot first. And that's supported by the sworn testimony of Idaho Police Captain Neal, who says Roderick admitted to him that he fired first. Also, Deegan definitely was not killed by the first bullet of the exchange because afterwards they found he had shot seven rounds from his gun. So Deegan was alive and shooting well into the firefight. With Deegan alive after he was supposed to be dead, and with an Idaho police captain giving sworn testimony that Marshal Roderick admitted he shot first, my money says the marshals fired first and then lied about it afterwards to cover their butts. Incidentally, just as at Waco a few months later, it may have been federal law enforcement agents shooting a dog that started the firefight that resulted in human death. One final aspect we should mention is the surviving U.S. Marshals claim that they identified themselves as Marshals, while Harris and Weaver maintain they did not. In fact, the Weavers indicate that nobody identified themselves for some time, so they didn't know who was shooting at them either on the first or second day of the siege. They were just defending themselves against unknown attackers at this point. There's no way to settle the matter definitively, but if the marshals already lied about who shot first, it's not particularly unreasonable to th believe that they didn't identify themselves either. What about the question of which marshal specifically killed Sammy Weaver by shooting him in the back? The fact William Deegan got off seven shots means it could have been him, and it would be easy to blame the dead guy, you know, and I found at least one account that suggests that that may have been the case, that somebody tried to pin the blame on Deegan as the one who killed Sammy. However, Marshal Roderick fired one shot and Marshal Cooper fired six, meaning that Cooper also could plausibly have done it based on the number of bullets fired. And this is what the preponderance of the evidence suggests. Both eyewitness evidence from Kevin Harris and forensic evidence points to Cooper as the one who killed Sammy. Multiple reviews of the evidence have concluded this. One review was made by the Boundary County Sheriff according to a 1997 article in the Spokane Spokesman Review. Scientific tests show that a bullet from a federal agent's gun killed Sammy Weaver at the outset of the 1992 Ruby Ridge standoff. Boundary County Sheriff Greg Sprungle made the disclosure Wednesday, finally answering the five-year-old mystery. The bullet that killed Randy Weaver's 14-year-old son came from a submachine gun fired by Deputy U.S. Marshal Larry Cooper, Sprungle said. It's a bullet from Cooper's gun, and it's conclusive, the sheriff said. Ballistic tests tie the bullet to Cooper's gun, Sprungle said. Trace evidence on the slug found in the woods convinced experts it was the one that had passed through Sammy Weaver's body. In court testimony, Larry Cooper denied that he fired the shot, saying that he didn't even see that Sammy was armed, and the last he saw, Sammy was running away after Cooper had fired his last shot. But since, on all accounts, the 14-year-old boy was shot in the back as he was retreating, it's understandable that nobody would want to take the responsibility for killing him. But the evidence points to Cooper. And then what crimes was Randy Weaver charged with when it was all over? On April 14th, 1993, while the Branch Davidians were holed up in their commune and the violent end of the Waco siege was nearing, Randy Weaver and Kevin Harris were put on trial. The U.S. Attorney's Office brought a really broad indictment against the two. They were really trying to throw the book at them. And in the opinion of many observers, this made it much harder for the prosecution. You know, you reach for too much and you may not get it. There were 10 counts against the two. Randy was charged with making illegal firearms, the original charge concerning the two sawed-off shotguns. He also was charged with failing to appear in court, the charge that brought the U.S. Marshals into the case. He was charged with committing crimes while on pretrial release, meaning crimes committed while out on bail 
He was charged with using a firearm to commit a violent crime. Meanwhile, Kevin Harris was charged with harboring a fugitive. Both Weaver and Harris were charged with uh, first-degree murder for the death of Marsha William Deegan. Both were charged with assaulting and resisting federal officers, and both were charged with conspiracy to provoke a violent confrontation. Defending Randy was famous American attorney Jerry Spence, a colorful character known for his trademark of wearing fringed buckskin jackets. He came to prominence in the 1970s for winning a $10 million verdict against the Kermagee plutonium plant in Oklahoma in the Karen Silkwood case. He is a member of the American Trial Lawyers Hall of Fame, and he decided to take Weaver's case because Despite the fact he didn't agree with Weaver's beliefs, he thought that Weaver had been entrapped and that law enforcement agents had acted unconscionably when they killed Sammy and Vicky. Defending Kevin Harris was Idaho-based attorney David Nevin, who came to prominence through the Ruby Ridge case. And what was the result of the trial? Well, spoiler warning, Jerry Spence has never lost a criminal trial, either as a prosecutor or as a defense attorney. On the charge of making illegal firearms, under Spence's direction, attorney Chuck Peterson got Kenneth Fadley, also known as Gus Magisono, to admit to 31 lies he told as part of his role as a professional informant. So they established he lied for a living. He pointed out that there weren't recordings of key meetings Fadley had with Weaver. He suggested that when Fadley pointed to where the shotgun barrels were to be cut, Weaver may have understood it as an instruction of where to cut, which would go to entrapment. And he got Fadley to admit that if Weaver weren't convicted, he wouldn't get certain monies, meaning he had a financial incentive to entrap Weaver and or lie about it afterwards. Randy was found not guilty of the charge of manufacturing illegal weapons, the charge that was the basis of everything that followed. What about the charge of not appearing in court? The jury found Weaver guilty on this charge, despite the fact that the authorities had screwed up by telling Weaver his court date had been rescheduled for March 20th instead of February 20th, and despite the fact the authorities didn't even wait for March 20th before indicting Randy for failing to appear, there was a desire on the part of the jury to punish Weaver for something, and so they convicted him of failing to appear in court. They also convicted him on a second charge, which was committing crimes while out on bail. But the judge set that ruling aside. And why did he set it aside? Well, he set that verdict aside because of the other things the jury found. Without putting on any defense witnesses, Jerry Spence and his team successfully argued that the other actions Weaver and Harris took were justified under the law as self-defense once they were under assault by federal law enforcement. The jury therefore ruled not guilty on using a firearm to commit a violent crime, not guilty on Harris harboring a fugitive, not guilty on first-degree murder for the death of William Deegan, not guilty on assaulting and resisting federal officers, and not guilty of conspiracy to provoke a violent confrontation. With Weaver found not guilty on all the other things he allegedly did while out on bail, there was no basis for the charge of committing crimes while out on bail. So the judge set it aside. For the only remaining charge, failure to appear in court, Randy was given a fine, which was paid by another person on his behalf, and he had to serve three months in prison besides those he served while waiting for the trial. Kevin Harris, not having been convicted of anything, was released immediately and walked out of the courtroom with his lawyer. If Weaver and Harris were now cleared, what about the federal authorities themselves? Even while the Ruby Ridge siege was underway, federal authorities started to realize they were on really shaky ground, legally speaking. And that only amplified once it was over. Jess Walter writes, By the spring of 1993, even before the trial, 
Each government agency blamed the others for the Weaver fiasco. FBI agents faulted ATF for investigating the Aryan nations, which was clearly FBI turf. They blamed the U.S. Marshal Service for the sloppy operations that preceded the gunfight and the U.S. Attorney's Office for its broad indictment. But people in those agencies believed the biggest mistake had been made by the FBI killing Vicki Weaver. Before looking at the death of Vicki, we should look at the events that preceded it on the second day. The first of these was the approval of the rules of engagement that instructed agents to shoot any armed adult male on sight. These were highly irregular rules of engagement, and there should be a paper trail on who approved them. And that person should have, at a minimum, lost his or her job or even faced prosecution for approving the, those rules of engagement. But guess what? Here's a clip from 1996 of Democratic Senator Herb Cole of Wisconsin addressing the matter after a Senate subcommittee investigated Ruby Ridge. Our report concludes that there is more than enough blame to spread around for the Ruby Ridge fiasco. Randy Weaver brought much of this upon himself, but federal law enforcement officials made a series of mistakes and blunders that clearly led to this tragedy. In our opinion, and as our report concludes, the rules of engagement contributed to Vicki Weaver's death. We expect more and we deserve better from our nation's finest. Our report also shows that federal law enforcement that demonstrated an inability to adequately investigate itself. We found it hard to swallow that the world's foremost investigative agency could not even determine who was responsible for rules that were written by its own leadership and drafted in part at its own headquarters. In trying to dodge the facts about Ruby Ridge, the FBI therefore made a bad situation even worse. I find it hard to swallow, too, that even four years later, the FBI had been unable to determine who wrote and approved the final version of the ridiculous rules of engagement. That reeks of cover-up. Somebody, in fact, several somebodies in the FBI knew who wrote and approved those orders, and they lied, concealed, and likely destroyed evidence to keep that information from being made public. FBI sniper Lon Horiuchi fired two shots on August 22nd, the first of which hit Randy, and the second of which killed Vicky. What happened as a result of those shots? When it came to the first shot, which occurred when Randy went to the birthing shed to see Sammy's body, Horiuchi later testified that he was trying to kill Randy by severing his spine, but he moved at the last moment. Horiuchi took the shot as Randy was reaching for the latch on the birthing shed to open the door and go inside. However, Horiuchi maintained that at the same time he was looking at Randy through the crosshairs of his sniper scope, he also heard a helicopter off in the distance and thought, somehow, that Randy's movements at the shed suggested he was looking for the helicopter and might take a shot at it. He therefore attempted to kill Randy ostensibly to protect the people in the helicopter. On its face, I find this story extremely difficult to believe. The actions of a man opening a latch on a door of a shed shouldn't look anything like the actions of a man searching the sky for a helicopter to take a shot at it. Furthermore, at Randy Weaver's trial, it came out that the helicopter was very distant, likely out of rifle range, only had a brief view of the cabin, and was in the opposite direction of where Horiuchi said it was. The helicopter story thus seems highly implausible to me. Nevertheless, it was used to justify Horiuchi taking the shot at Randy, and later reviews concluded that the presence of the helicopter made this shot constitutional. So what about the second shot when Horiuchi killed Vicky? Here, the helicopter defense didn't apply because Randy, Sarah, and Kevin were all clearly fleeing towards the cabin for cover and were not posing a threat to anyone. Apart from the insane rules of engagement, Horiuchi had no justification for shooting at Kevin, who was wounded by the second shot. Consequently, the second shot was judged unconstitutional since you can't deprive anyone of life without due process of law. Also, Horiuchi was severely criticized for shooting towards the cabin door without knowing whether anyone was behind it, which Vicky was. 
Did Horiuchi face prosecution for his actions? For a while, in 1997, he did. Just before the statute of limitations ran out, the Boundary County prosecutor indicted Horiuchi for manslaughter under Idaho state law, and she appointed a special prosecutor to handle the case. However, in 1998, the trial was moved to federal court because Horiuchi had been acting as a federal agent. Once that happened, the case was dismissed on grounds of Supremacy Clause immunity. This is a form of immunity that courts have invented and granted to government agents based on the idea that federal law is the supreme law of the land and thus trumps local law. It's kind of a parallel to the similarly judge-invented doctrine of qualified immunity, which grants them similar immunity from civil prosecution. But when a panel of judges reviewed the decision, they determined that supremacy clause immunity did not apply in this case. And so they overturned the ruling and ruled that Horiuchi could be prosecuted for manslaughter in Idaho. However, by this point, Boundary County had a new prosecutor, and he decided to drop the case, a controversial decision that was vehemently objected to by the special prosecutor on the case. Personally, I agree with the special prosecutor. Even in the military, under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, one is obliged only to obey the lawful orders of one's superiors, and obeying an unlawful order can result in criminal prosecution. Horiuchi should have known that because he was a former member of the military. At this point, he wasn't even a member of the military, and the orders he was given were not only unlawful, but unconstitutional. There is no way he should have fired on these people, especially when they were fleeing, and he should have been prosecuted. But He was allowed to skate free, and thus none of the federal employees involved in this disaster ever faced criminal prosecution. Horiuchi would go on to serve at the Waco siege, where he would at one point be reported as firing on the commune during the disastrous final confrontation. Spent shells would be found at his location though it was later concluded that they would be hard to match with his rifle since, quote, it probably had been fitted with a new barrel since that time, close quote. So he may have not only been taking improper shots at Ruby Ridge, but at Waco as well. If the criminal courts didn't end up prosecuting any of these people, did anything happen in the civil courts? Yes, Randy Weaver and his daughters sued the federal government for $200 million for the deaths of Sammy and Vicki. To keep the case from going to trial, the government settled the case in 1995 by giving each of the three daughters $1 million and also giving Randy $100,000. And the government got off cheap. The Washington Post reported that an anonymous Department of Justice source told them that it was believed in the department that the Weavers could have gotten the full $200 million if they had pressed the case, but they didn't. Also, Kevin Harris filed a civil suit, and though the government said they would never pay a person who had killed a U.S. Marshal, they also saw the writing on the wall and settled the case. In 2000, Harris received $380,000 as a settlement. Did the FBI learn any broader lessons from this? Not immediately. As we discussed in episodes 96 and 97, many of the same officials and agents went on to work the Waco siege, where the hostage rescue team put in an even more disastrous performance. But after the Waco debacle, there were some changes. And the investigations that followed Ruby Ridge also taught them some things. For one thing, the rules of engagement were reviewed and a commitment was made to never again use the disastrous rules of engagement that were employed on August 22nd and that led to Vicki Weaver's death. Unfortunately, a great deal of damage had been done, and between Ruby Ridge and Waco, radical elements in the militia movement had been inflamed, and in 1995, Timothy McVeigh would bomb the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, taking 168 lives, a subject that we'll be discussing in a future episode. So that's the reason perspective. What can we say about Ruby Ridge from the faith perspective? The moral issues here are fairly straightforward. We've already talked about the evil of racism, 
While the Weavers weren't members of Aryan nations and had disagreements with them, they were foolish to get so involved with such people, and their own views were highly problematic, not only on racial subjects, but on others as well. Like the Branch Davidians, who we should remember were an interracial group that disapproved of the Weavers' racial separatist views, the Weavers bought into a false apocalyptic worldview that helped create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Their erroneous conviction that there would be an imminent attempt to impose a New World Order government as part of the end times led them to take an attitude towards the government that set the stage for what happened. While that in no way justifies the abominable acts committed by federal law enforcement, if the Weavers had acted differently, this wouldn't have happened. If they had not been associated with Aryan Nations people, the ATF would never have tried to entrap Randy so they could squeeze him to become a source for them. If he had carefully obeyed gun laws, he never would have made the sawed-off shotguns that violated the legal limit on barrel length, giving them leverage over him. I mean, if he'd just done it a quarter of an inch higher, he would have been fine. If he and Vicky hadn't decided to stop dealing with the law enforcement officials and had been more engaged in their case, they might have known the correct date for the case, despite the misinformation they were given in the, in the letter they were sent. And if Randy had managed to show up for his court date, this whole thing wouldn't have happened. On the government's part, the whole scenario was absolutely abominable. Entrapping people into being sources for you is immoral, whether it crosses the line into illegality in particular cases or not. The authorities did an incompetent job investigating Randy and concluded he represented far more of a threat than he actually did, just as in the case of the Branch Davidians. They told many falsehoods about Weaver and his family, including the idea he was a bank robber. They apparently shot first killed Sammy Weaver, and then lied about it afterwards. They issued unconstitutional and gravely immoral rules of engagement, which Lon Horiuchi then acted upon, wounding Randy and Kevin and killing Vicky while she was holding a baby. And then they lied and obfuscated to cover their butts in the aftermath of it all, including about who it was that approved the orders, which they still haven't determined. So what can you tell us about where the Weavers are today? The survivors, Randy and his three surviving daughters, are still around. Randy is 72, and he's still active in right-wing circles, though he largely keeps a low profile. In 1999, he remarried and is still married. As of 2007, it appeared that he had lost his religious faith, saying that he was not afraid of dying and was curious about the afterlife, but that he was an atheist. I don't know if he has regained his faith in the last 13 years, but we may certainly pray that he has or that he does before he dies. The most public of his daughters has been Sarah, the oldest. She also has largely lived quietly, though she has given some interviews, and she also became a born-again Christian. So, Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the Ruby Ridge incident? As in the case of the Branch Davidians, the Weavers were a problematic family but they were not what federal law enforcement made them out to be. They in no way deserved the slaughter that was visited upon them. This was a horrendous example of government arrogance and overreach, and it is a shame that there was not more accountability for the officials involved. We can only hope that the lessons that were learned stick well enough to prevent similar incidents from happening in the future. So, Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners? We'll have Jess Walter's book, Ruby Ridge, John Ronson's book, Them, Adventures with Extremists, Gary Nosner's book, Stalling for Time, My Life as an FBI Hostage Negotiator. We'll have links to pages on Ruby Ridge, Randy Weaver, Bo Greitz, Entrapment, the Department of Justice Ruby Ridge Task Force Report, and the charges with verdicts against Weaver and Harris. Also, the sheriff's review of the evidence on who killed Sammy and a page on Lon Horiuchi. All right. So at this point, we would normally be giving you some of the mysterious feedback that we love to get from our listeners. But our episode this week is longer than usual, and we've gotten some 
really good feedback that we don't want to shortchange because of time limitations. So we're going to be delaying mysterious feedback by a week, but we will be getting to your feedback on all of our recent episodes soon. So, Jimmy, uh, what do we have for mysterious headlines this week? Well, we've got a Dyatlov Pass update for folks. One of the things that we've been covering is the fact that the Russian authorities had opened a new investigation into what happened at Dyatlov Pass, which we originally discussed way back in episode 24. It's a very mysterious event. This is like the biggest Russia mystery in Russia. It's their equivalent of the JFK assassination with numerous different theories about what happened, because the evidence doesn't seem to quite fit any given theory you propose. Well, we've mentioned the new Russian investigation, and the results of that are now in. So we'll have a link to an article where the Russian authorities try to explain what happened at Dyatlov Pass. Their explanation is two-part. They say that they think the hikers cut their way out of the tent in the middle of the night because of an avalanche. There wasn't an avalanche near the tent, but maybe they heard one, and that's why they panicked and cut themselves out. And then, because of poor visibility conditions, they couldn't find their way back into the tent. So that's the Russian authorities' theory. We'll have a second article where the families reject the government's account and propose a different theory of what happened, where apparently various members of the survivors from the Dyatlov Pass hiker families believe that a Russian rocket or missile was involved, and they want the bodies exhumed and tested to look for combustion products Mm. that would have been left on them by the rocket. And so check out that as well, although I do have to warn you, it's in a British tabloid paper, and There is a disturbing picture of one of the the Dyatlov Pass bodies, but it's otherwise it's got some fascinating info in it. Very good. Excellent. So we do want to ask for your feedback on today's episode. What are your theories and reflections on what happened at Ruby Ridge? You can let us know online by going to sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page or by sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, or sending a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. If you're not yet uh, done so, please subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, your favorite podcast app, or at the SQPN YouTube channel, where you should make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. And you'll find links to all of Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to those mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.